I've been told this is a work in progress uh, discussion and it looks very much like that. Yeah. These types of books uh, you presented, when does this um, tendency, let's say, come to an end? I mean, I don't think they ever really died out. Instead of thinking that it died out, I would say that um, only more new forms have emerged alongside because of, you know, there's more books now than there ever have been before. And um, so I would say there's just more and more genres emerging at the same time. At the very top of this board, I, we've kind of started adding some of the more technical. Mm -hmm. um, I see. I see. Manuals and handbooks. Manual, a handbook or textbook, especially a small or compendious one, a concise treatise, an abridgment. Handbook, a book small enough to be easily portable and intended to be kept close to hand. Typically one containing a collection of passages important for reference or a compendium of information on a particular subject. My period of research is 19th century, and so I'm looking specifically at um, the period from 1840 to 1890. But I've been trying to do is sort of define um, what a manual is for the purposes of my time period. Yeah. Um, and while doing that, I came across, in fact, an entirely new category of architectural book, mm -hmm. which is neither handbook nor manual, but actually catalog. What I basically did was I grabbed a bunch of um, illustrations of one architectural element, um, yes. which was the corner. We grabbed a bunch of um, uh, spreads that show cornices and maybe in order to kind of talk about what the manual and the catalogue are, mm -hmm. the purposes of my research, it's maybe good to kind of chart a path through those representations of cornices over yeah. time and see how the different books actually represent them. Yeah. So, I mean, if we go like to the very, very early, what you call prehistory. Yes. Um, there's Palladio's cornices from Quattro Libri and they are, in a way, they're sort of um, attempts to measure and define what classical architecture is for the first time. So, you know, the, the kind of great task of the Renaissance was to mm -hmm. basically produce that knowledge um, that had been not lost, but sort of placed in a different category and now yeah. was being revived in print predominantly. Mm -hmm. So this kind of inquiry into the cornice, for example, is in a way an attempt to kind of measure and define that. And then um, if we move on to the 18th century, yeah. when, you know, we have, say, I'm, I'm looking at Britain. So William Chambers, a treatise on the decorative part of civil architecture, um, or something like Friar de Chambre's mm -hmm. um, parallel um, were in the same way that Palladio was kind of inquiring into kind of these technical aspects of architecture. Um, there was a revival of doing that in the, in the 18th century and the 17th century as well, but even in an even more kind of scientific way. So yeah. using the kind of scientific theories of the enlightenment to actually um, interrogate the rules of classical architecture. And so the famous um, parallel um, here, which kind of attempts to find a norm, a kind of standard for architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the purpose of these books. But then basically I wouldn't classify those as, as manuals. I, I tend to classify those as architectural treatises. Yeah, yeah. And then alongside of that, um, there is basically something else going on. Mm -hmm. which is a kind of book which is um, smaller, more, as you say, a little bit more portable, um, more uh, printable, like easy, easily, more easily able to be printed. So the illustrations mm -hmm. are simpler. So if you say these are um, copper plate engravings um, and you can see the detail and, and the expense of that and they're quite big books, um, these are the, the books that I'm looking at are they're um, smaller they're also illustrations are simpler so they're mm -hmm. actually going back to the woodblock print of Palladio's time rather than using the copper plate um, so there's a kind of crudity of the illustration in a way so this is for example 
here, I think, is um, here's what I've classified as, say, like uh, the early building manuals that um, that kind of prefigure my time period. Um, and these are British, um, and they're starting around 1750 and going into about 1830. Um, and so they're kind of like whole house building manuals. Yeah. Um, and what I like about this one is it's called um, Payne's British Palladio. Um, so <laughs> it's a kind of, it, it, it takes Palladio, basically, it takes, it takes a kind of canonical uh, and quite scholarly, considered quite scholarly architectural treatise and kind of yeah. makes it a practical thing, makes it something that one can use to do something. So, uh, we, so we, uh, there are actually two, uh, two, two kind of points that I, that I, uh, that comes to my mind when I look at this. The first one is that on one hand, it, this, the idea of doing a British Palladio to me uh, resonates and reminds me of the, of the Vitruvius Britannicus. And so mm. the idea that you take a classic author and you turn it into, um, into something much more local somehow, and you sort of translate it for a, for a specific public. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't really seem to have anything to do with the tradition of treatises, except the fact that, um, again, uh, it sort of borrows the name from a, not from a classic author. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but, then we... other, but on the other hand, uh, I, I cannot help but noticing, and I noticed this on other examples that you provided, um, that the terminology adopted to describe these books uh, is actually extremely interesting to me. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, you, I found words like assistant that you find here, um, instructor, uh, mate, um, guide. I also found uh, darling, uh, treasure. Mm -hmm. There are all these sort of terminologies adopted to actually enumerate or kind of identify the purpose of a book that uh, are in incredibly human somehow. And, and they point at really at the... The, of the social dimension no, of, of this book. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of target, maybe that's a good way to talk about, you know, the target audience. Mm -hmm. um, they are targeted towards um, what I've, I've tried to kind of summarize what they're directed to. And yeah. I, I'd say like, you know, they're, they're directed to, um, they are directed towards professional builders and artisans, but also at amateur builders, amateur clients. Um, who want to build their own homes. So there's a kind of an everyman quality to the potential yeah. audience of this book. It's not necessarily a, a fully educated in the classical sense audience as the yeah. previous treatise, readers of the previous treatises would have been assumed to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, th I mean, didn't think so much about the, the actual words in the title, but um, I think you're really right about that. And what I like about the titles as well is that they're, they just become so long they basically yeah. tell you in the title everything that you're going to get from yes. this book. And what you also get from a spread like this, first of all, in that one, so the cornice here is similarly to the way Palladio does it, actually. Mm -hmm. It's measured out and it's shown um, in its dimensions. Um, but then because it's actually um, telling you how to build it, it's also giving you instructions on how to actually put the thing together. Yeah. And what it also gives you is a whole series of options and I find that that's one of the things that classifies the manuals beginning around this period. It's really about options. It's yeah. no longer about what is the right, um, what is the correct classical architecture. It's about here are all the options that you can have. Yeah. So there's a sense of the consumer which comes into it. And also a sense that um, the kind of the canonical rules of architecture is sort of breaking down. Mm -hmm. So the manual comes in as the canonical rules break down um, and then you have something like, you know, you can have this cornice or this cornice or this cornice and you can have this pattern or this pattern or this pattern. So you can have sort of any pattern, but why not choose one of these, the ones that we provided for you? So there's also that kind of aspect of choice that comes into it yeah. as well. And it also into something like this, which um, is a kind of another... Uh, it's actually less a manual um, in terms of a how-to document and more of actually a, a pattern book for designs. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a slightly different category of the same period. And it's also a kind of pocket, it's, it's actually a pocket-sized thing in contrast to the earlier treatises. And it yeah. gives um, a set of, um, of kind of timber designs that, that a craftsman 
can actually copy. So the sense of like the pattern book becoming available for workers to copy. Um, and also, which goes actually hand in hand with the fact that there are there were more and more unskilled workers, um, more in the 19th century, kind of coming yeah. into the building trade. So these um, manuals were used by unskilled or less skilled workers to actually instruct. Um, I'm actually wondering, I mean, the author of, of these, the authors of these books, um, they were, as I understand correctly, they were also directly involved in the building world. They were contractors, carpenters, uh, rather than, let's say, printers or, you know, bookmakers. One majorly interesting and kind of early um, is to look at the collection of um, Governor Macquarie, who was the mm -hmm. governor to New South Wales, which was um, at that time was Australia did not exist. It was the state of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And um, Governor Macquarie was uh, sent, he was a Scottish um a Scottish guy actually, but he was sent by the British government to govern over the territory of New South Wales um, in the early 19th century. And he brought with him um, a very precious set of books um, because he had ambitions to um, build uh, Sydney, uh, Sydney, Australia into a proper city. So it was kind of, it was a penal colony. It was a prison camp. And Governor Macquarie had ambitions to kind of elevate Sydney into to some kind of um, cultural uh, center as much as it could be um, in in Australia yeah. at that time, but he brought with him this set of books, and um, contained within that set of books is William Payne's British Palladio. Yeah. Also contained um, within is um, another of William Payne's books. This one, The Practical mm -hmm. House Carpenter. So there are some of these books which have, have appeared in his collection and I would say that that is a kind of interesting um, sort of global audience that these books actually had and these books emerging at the time of um, basically Britain's extreme expansion, global yeah. expansion, um, is really kind of, I think it's really interesting and if I actually just pop to the internet for a second mm -hmm. I can show you the kind of ambitions that some of these books had. Um, so they also had ambitions to um, go to um, South America. So one of them, I think it's actually, yeah, it's here. So this one, for example, um, this is a, a later trade catalog. So when I say trade catalog, it's, it's, it's authored by a contractor um, who also produced ironwork. Um, and every single um, page of this book is written in both Spanish <laughs> and English. So um, they were because, especially tailored for to be exported, essentially. Yeah, that, well, that was his ambition. He was trying to break into the uh, Peruvian market, specifically. Um, this was Charles Young, contractor. And um, he, in the very beginning, of the book, if I can find where it is. Um, he writes um, that this is an illustrated and descriptive catalog, um, machinery, implements, tools, manufactured articles and raw materials um, for scientific and practical purposes in South America and other countries. So um, he was trying to break into the kind of lucrative, lucrative Peruvian market. And so his entire, um, <laughs> His entire book was written in both yeah. languages. But um, so, yeah, I'm wondering why, to the movement of people, uh, it was preferred the movement of books. So why why didn't carpenters themselves move and and get involved directly in in building? Because that to me seems more lucrative, you know. Mm, um, yeah, I mean, I guess in the case of Australia, there were very few craftsmen very few skilled craftsmen in the colony, they had to pull craftsmen out of convict lines mm -hmm. and pardon them so they could work on buildings. Um, and there just wasn't the skill set. And the British government wasn't interested in sending the skill set because they weren't interested in um, Sydney being anything other than a prison camp. So um, these books were kind of valuable sources of information in that context. Yeah. Um, but, but I think um, 
Also, it's interesting that the books traveled are not the people necessarily because it leads to um, a whole, if I zoom down, it leads to the development of a whole lot of local yeah. industries. So, um, for example, Walter McFarlane, um, who was, uh, then again, I would classify this as a trade catalogue rather than a manual. The difference being that um, the trade catalogue is uh, printing a, a kind of compendium of products that you can purchase, whereas the manual is telling you how to build something. Yeah. And so this is that that's for me is the main difference. And usually the trade catalog is authored by a company, a contractor mm. or, or, so, or so, and the trade catalog is authored by a craftsman or a builder, typically. Um, it's so it's directly connected to the, let's say, the workshop of that particular person. Yes. Yeah, so these are both advertisements. They're, they're both advertisements, or well, essentially they are as advertisements for products. Yeah. Um, and they are they're the kind of new architectural book that I kind of discover from mm -hmm. 1840, coming in from about 1840 onwards, when the building trade is reorganized um, into a kind of there's a kind of overall contractor and then all the subcontractors. So previously, individual craftsmen would come to the workshop, would come to the come to the project, and they would carry out their work. Um, and mm. now, sort of, that you have a contractor who would engage all the trades and deal with the whole kind of thing, and might be managing a huge construction site of multiple houses. Yeah. Um, so then, and also, so prefabrication becomes um, a huge um, part of the the kind of development of the technological building world from 1840 onwards. And but so then it's interesting that the, um, in a way the diffusion of this kind of literature um, uh, again it, it establishes a very direct connection with uh, let's say the the industry and and the way in which the industry itself is being transformed um, uh, and so I mean it seems to somehow follow that uh, again the industrialization of building mass production prefabrication and so on but at the same time uh, the question obviously is uh, did these books also have a say or an impact in the, the uh, let's say, commodization of, of, of building? Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the terms of these um, products, maybe the, the kind of the thing that I was trying to explain what happened was Walter McFarlane's catalogues were sent to Australia um, and they were ordered directly from to erect um, big housing developments in mm -hmm. Sydney during the Victorian period, which look like this. That's a very typical Sydney housing. And all of these, um, these elements were um, ordered from the catalogue. But then what started to happen um, was that basically um, local, uh, local foundries of iron started up. So Sun Foundry, which was um, an Australian foundry, began to produce their own catalogues. And I don't have actually a copy of that here. Um, but they then kind of answered the British catalogues with their own designs, which actually began to include um, mm. sort of whimsical local flora and fauna uh, and animals in the kind yeah. of iron designs. So then maybe the book is sort of, um, in that sense, allows for reinterpretation and then republication of um, new models. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering now if you could say a little bit more about the authors of these books, because we have a whole, <laughs> in this board, we, and we were talking about this earlier, we yeah. have a whole um, kind of space dedicated to the authors. And it's very interesting that, I mean, we were able somehow to trace some of these um, figures, you know, from before and from after, but it's interesting the 19th century seems to be a very uh, there seems to be a very sort of empty gap. You could say that the fact that uh, the history of, of manuals is such an anonymous history or tends to be faceless, um, you know, could also have an impact, impact on the fact that this is a, a category of literature that in architecture has been um, quite overlooked over time. Mm. In the case of the 17th century, uh, the question of anonymity, I think, becomes even more uh, even I think even more clear because the ones who were writing these books were not even con uh, contractors, they were printers. And so they were oh, there yeah, really? in, in, entirely to make a profit out of making books. Um, well, yeah, so as you can see, there's a huge space during my time period that we've been working on. I mean, there on, isn't much to begin with, um, probably say where, that. Yeah, where like I couldn't find actually pictures of any of the authors because often they don't, just don't really exist. And I think that's quite telling. Um, 
because you can always find a picture of William Chambers or Palladio or Friar de Chambre, but you won't find a picture of William Payne and you won't find, that's why he's here under a blank square. And you don't find a picture of probably the most, um, the author of the most successful plastering manual or most successful building manual of all time um, in terms of sheer sales. So mm. This book is, was first published in 1899 and it is still in production, the latest edition being in 2010. Um, mm -hmm. And you ask um, any craftsman, plaster craftsman or someone working with conservation of buildings um, and they will say they still refer to this book in their work. Um, so in a sense, you could think, you could say that's like probably the most successful manual of all time, but there's no picture of William Miller or what, or what he, I don't know what he looks like. Um, <laughs> What you do have is a kind of title page, um, which is a little bit telling of the kind of person he was. So um, this is his uh, kind of frontispiece. And this says that, um, that he's part of the National Association of Operative Plasterers. Mm -hmm. And he displays quite proudly his, um, his admission to yeah. um, the association on the bottom of his frontispiece. Um, yeah. doesn't put a picture of himself, but he puts this certification to say that he is a certified craftsman. Um, and he has the two, he has the Masonic symbol and also, I don't know yet what this symbol is. Um, but that's his kind of signature. If we go to William Miller, um, it's a beautiful book because it's not just a manual. Um, it is actually um, a whole history of architecture from the perspective of a plasterer. So it's as if... Um, it's as if, uh, arch if arch the history of architecture was told by through plastering. So he goes through um, the whole history of the earliest plaster buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole section, not only on the history of Western architecture, but on the history of world architecture from the point of view of a plasterer. Um, so oh, wow. you imagine that by, you know, 1899, the world is somehow accessible. Mm -hmm. So he includes actually Islamic architecture, um, plastering of Islamic architecture um, and um, various other kind of global plastering wonders. Yeah. Um, and so for that, I find the book like really endearing because it actually connects in a way that an architectural treatise like Chambers doesn't connect um, yeah. the, the building of architecture with its theory and history. Um, and this yeah. does that in a way that no treatise really um, does do, I find. Well, I mean, it seems to me that the manual actually has, in, in terms of its own, let's say, identity, a very specific or tends to have specific uh, literary forms. And so it's written and, and illustrated in, in its own kind of specific ways. Uh, it uses uh, strategies that <clears throat> treaties or other architectural books uh, don't really do. Uh, for example, the least or the, the kind of um, charts. Uh, it's generally very heavy illustrated, but the illustrations are obviously of a technical nature. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm interested in the kind of written strategies. Um, and I want to, in a way, um, examine that a bit more. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I've mainly been looked at, looking at visual strategies. Um, yeah. And so um, that's something that I've sort of been focusing on and I found that it's very connected to um, what is available in terms of print technology at the time. So like, for example, the, um, the simplification of, so this is, this is the cornice, which has more in common with Palladio's cornice than Friar de Chambre or yeah. from Chambers, for example, because this is using woodblock technique, woodblock printing as Palladio did um, in for like, speed and ease of printing mm -hmm. whereas like chambers was using copper plate printing because it was for like a very select wealthy yeah. group of clients who could pay for it um so but um, during the 19th century printing itself becomes uh or sort of enters into a into an industrial age right yeah so that's why i put down here um in your section technological developments mm -hmm. i put koenig steam power printing press um and yeah sort of early 19th century and lithography. Lithography um, was a huge development in um, 
image printing, allowing for like faster printing of images and the for the image not to deteriorate over time. Yeah. So with copper plate printing that eventually the image would deteriorate and you couldn't print any more out of it. Whereas yeah. um, lithography, you can keep, just keep printing. And then lithography also then leads to chromolithography, which is color. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, so those two kind of inventions are like, I think kind of tight, quite tied to um, yeah. how the images work. And then again, um, the idea of lists or stacking of products. Mm -hmm. So it goes from the kind of, the kind of the cornice. So if we go back to the cornice, it goes from the cornice to by the mid 18, so by the 1850s to cornices, multiple. So this is a cornice you can buy um, and it's kind of stacked up. And the most literal um, yeah. example of that is Carl Friedrich Schinkel's Vorbilder for Fabrikanten and Handwerker, um, which was actually a, the only German one I've put here, um, mm -hmm. which was an initiative to, it was a pattern book for um, Prussian craftsmen to use for free um, because they were hoping to raise the standard of design in Prussia. Um, and here mm -hmm. the cornices are literally just like stacked one on top of the other. Um, so it goes from like the single image to just stacked images until you have, and that somehow goes with the lists as well. So this is actually um, an 1891 um, kind of uh, American uh, catalog actually where the cornices are numbered and stacked and then you can go mm. to the table and you can find it and you can and you can um, purchase it and this one as well which is another very literal stacking what I like about this is these are cornices but they're also um, building gutters prefabricated building gutters that you buy by the meter and they kind of given this kind of cornice look yeah. uh, face to them and they're also kind of just stacked up as a whole series of like multiple products and somehow that figures also into pictures of the workshops at the time, yeah. which is, um, that's like George Jackson workshops um, mm -hmm. around, after 1834. So around the same time as this catalog they produced where all the cornices you can see are just kind of like stacked up one upon yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering whether the adoption of these books, which uh, as we were saying before, as we were saying before, have a component of anonymity, um, which somehow cannot be separated from them, also pro produced uh, a building world that, um, a built environment that was itself anonymous. And so, I mean, the question I guess is, is more about the sort, of, the sort of buildings that were then produced. It, uh... Well, this is, um, this is the sort of example of the anonymity mm -hmm. um, aspect of it. That's a Victorian housing development in London, um, which would have used many of the products in those catalogs um, more prefabricated and so that in a sense is maybe the anonymous aspect of it although for the kind of middle class person who was aspiring to live in one of these houses um, yeah. it wouldn't have been anonymous for them but actually a kind of palace and what you notice that and that's what brings me to kind of what another thing I notice about the shift um, in the 19th century or even the late um, 18th century, which is the shift to um, depicting um, decorations of interiors. Mm -hmm. So the interest of manuals and catalogues of the 19th century is chiefly the interior, um, because that is the kind of arena where the middle class person can express his yeah. or her imagined individuality. Mm -hmm. And then that, that like aspect of choice comes into it. So all the cornices I showed you um, from that period, they're, they're often mainly kind of interior, interior um, yeah. cornices, whereas, you know, the treatises, they don't really concern themselves. The older treatises don't really concern themselves which, what, with what kind of decoration is going on yeah. in the interior. They're chiefly concerned with um, the facade. You could almost say that the where, where, where the treatise is talking to the public, the, the manual is in a way talking to the private, right? It's mm -hmm. It is talking to the private. And I think it's the, interesting, uh, yeah, that it talks to the private at the very moment that the urban field explodes like yeah. and London becomes more in a way public than ever before the yeah. architecture starts to really talk to the private man um, and I think that that is to kind of um, rediscover you know, a sort of sense of identity perhaps yeah yeah so it's both anonymous in one sense but also not anonymous because it kind of aspires to the kind of creation of a, an individualized interior yeah. Which is also, I mean, it's interesting because it's also 
probably, I mean, it seems to be the reason why architecture is in a way decomposed and disassembled into individual components. And so in the while the treaties tended to, to showcase buildings, the manual tends to present its parts. You never see the building yeah. fully formed, but it's only a collection of it's different of components, almost like, like an anomaly. Yeah, I mean, the, the early ones, like the William Payne um, ones, where would I put those? Are oh, here. Um, the, the two William Paynes, they actually did, besides kind of um, instructions mm -hmm. on how to make roofs and things like that, they actually did often present kind of um, home designs, but then, so that would be a typical yeah. kind of William Payne home design, but then you know, on top of that, there's a diagram of like how all the um, chimney flues are going to work. Yeah. And that I find great um, because yes. it's really concerned with like how it's, how this house is going to actually work from an interior perspective. And it's really cutting through for like to show the interior rather than the facade. Yeah. In terms of anonymity, there's another take on anonymity, um, which is actually um, the huge problem of uh, copyright and patent ripoffs in the mm. 19th century. Um, so a typical case in point was Charles D. Young of the um, Peruvian aspirations. So yeah. he um, produced that catalogue, Illustrations of Iron Structures in 1857, claiming that they were all produced by his foundry or his, his, his contractors. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally he acknowledged some of the designs as having been designed by a Bell and Miller architects and engineers. So kind of, I haven't. I mean, yeah. there's not very little information about that firm, sort of a second tier architecture firm, supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, but on the strength of these illustrations and him claiming they came from him, all of these Australian buildings made of iron were attributed to him. So Corio Villa in Geelong, which is a fully iron building um, down to the very walls, um, was attributed to him on the strength of this illustration. Um, an iron church, prefab also prefabricated in Macquarie Street, Sydney, was attributed to him. Um, and that is a completely iron building. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, another kind of famous one is the New South Wales Parliament, which um, has an iron face on one of its ends. Mm -hmm. And that was also attributed to him. But he ripped off, he was well known to have ripped off um, plenty of other um, contractors, products and designs um, so when he he sort of claimed that he gave them a platform to showcase their work and he just put it all together for them um, and but it was always very hard to know um, who what, who had really designed it or who had really produced it because it was very hard to enforce copyright and even if you go into the patents um, so 19th century patents office has all these patents of like um, different um, iron uh, systems that were invented and painted by certain people or contractors um, and he had no problems with um, ripping off these systems and using them in his catalogue so it is really hard to attribute authorship um, in that sense and that's another way that things kind of almost do become anonymous by you mentioned that uh, you are actually using these manuals um, in your teaching and this yeah. is I think something that I find extremely interesting because it's it really, in a way, um, it seems like an attempt to also uh, verify or, or you know, um, try out the agency of these books once it really, once you really go into design. Um, so in a way, like it, um, it kind of, it's interesting to see how um, some of those um, tectonic details can actually come into kind of contemporary design responses to old buildings yeah. um, and whether they can be used. I think that like the use is limited. You can't completely mm -hmm. replicate, um, you know, the, the designs yeah. from that period, but um, it allows you to understand certain principles like the principle of the component that forms the city, for example, is like yeah. present in this illustration. Um, and on a very basic level it also um, basically gives um, models for how to represent architecture or architectural ideas I was, I was inventive. wondering exactly about that I mean because yeah. it seems that uh, I mean from the point of view of students especially uh, this actually is an, an extremely direct um, uh, way of understanding buildings and how building 
actually work, yeah. which is something that doesn't necessarily happen very much in architecture school. And the, these books seem to be a very kind of uh, direct access in, into that world and that world only. This one is a beautiful, because um, what it does, it illustrates a process as well mm -hmm. as a product. And um, I think that's interesting. So basically this, um, <laughs> this is from Peter Nicholson's Dictionary of the Science and Practice of Architecture and Building Carpentry of 1857. And it is a drawing of um, basically um, the, like a lighthouse mm -hmm. um, and showing the manner of landing and hoisting the stones in every stage of building. Yeah. So it's, it's a drawing of the construction of lighthouse. Um, so a temporal process in kind of fixed single image. Yeah, and that's what that. these catalogs do really well, which um, students would do well to learn basically if they're trying to describe yeah. kind of um, the kind of construction process. What this manual handbook face uh, is the rise of bureaucracy. Mm. Because actually treaties were kind of book that were related to ideas. If you, if you, if you look at the history of architecture throughout the, uh, you know, what manual authors wrote, you don't find uh, you don't find a mirror with the history of idea that was somehow produced during the 20th century. You find an anonymous history, an unknow mostly unknown history, but there is also somehow this other issue that is, was a kind of a norm, a process of norm that was rising up, starting from the, the enlightenment. So I think that this relationship with the state and the rise of bureaucracy mm -hmm. is crucial in order to put at stake really why handbooks are that kind of literature uh, typology that, that emerged along that, that century. Um, in a way, I also see them as like ways of getting around bureaucracy as much as they are kind of reflectors of it. And so I think they're a little bit more they can be a little bit more subversive than that and a little bit more clever than that in a sense that their books become necessary um, not to explain bureaucracy but to actually kind of chart a way around it and yeah. so I think that um, that's also kind of um, yeah, that's something good. nice about it. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if um, you know all the examples that they give for corner stone, stones or for, for other parts of a facade, for instance, what if you hesitate um, uh, to be complete, for instance, to give all the options that you know, um, if there would be uh, somewhere um, room for that hesitation, for instance, uh, um, the, the beautiful book, books of, of Gressner, for instance, he added the unicorn to his collection simply to um, knowing that um, or he wasn't sure about it but that wasn't a hesitation to not putting it in it was until it was proven that it doesn't exist that he put it a unicorn to his collection somehow i've been wondering why some profiles or decorations survived and others die um, and so between certain publications there's a gap that where things happen or things don't happen or things get picked up or they don't get picked up and so there's a lot of like uncertainty in like the way that patterns or ornaments travel. So for example, between here and here, there's like mutations, modifications, all kinds of kind of changes. And the task of William Miller was to actually like make certain a kind of set um, number of profiles of every period of cornices. And he would say, okay, this is it. This is all the profiles of the Jacobean period. This is all the profiles of the Elizabethan period. This is like it. And then you wonder what gets lost along the way. I have, I have one remark on this, is that of course, this kind of manual tends to fulfill the entire range of variations of, a, of an element, right? But uh, there is a certain, you know, unaccomplished uh, result. There is a certain, uh, you know, kind of incompleteness and this kind of incomplete is always the building. You never find the building. The building is not the complete uh, unity towards this end book stands to. Uh, 
in the treaties, you, what you find is always the binding as a unity to which, you know, other things tends to. I wonder if that's got something to do with the fact that it's, that, that it's a lot about the interior and the difficulty mm -hmm. of actually representing interiors in any kind of complete way. I'm wondering if, if there is an influence of um, fashion design because all of this detailing and decorative patterns uh, remind me of uh, furniture, uh, but also clothing somehow. And I'm wondering if yeah. there is like a, like a let's say, uh, fashion taste that comes into play and it's specific obviously to its own time. And you know- I think, I mean? yeah, like I think if anything, it might've been a response to literature. So rather than it being, rather than the manual decorative elements being a response to fashion. I think both decorative elements and fashion were a response to literature um, and the kind of rise of the Gothic novel or the romance novel um, or the poetry. Um, and then the kind of that, then the Gothic element comes into women's fashion and then also creep into the decorative um, fashions that you see, um, the kind of overblown or quite like over-decorated um kind of uh things and then the other thing probably is like um the kind of availability of um ideas about foreignness so like chinoiserie or kind of middle eastern kind of um decorative elements um all kind of come getting fused into the kind of european tradition which is this one mm -hmm. and then to produce kind of mad crazy um things like this. So I think there's a there's an interesting play. There's some manuals that, to sort of put it bluntly, their, their aim is to somehow try and emancipate or uplift or upgrade the, the skills or the aesthetic of the craftsman. And then I think that there might be several cases where the, uh, the intention of the author is to actually control the craftsman because they are too free. That's a, yeah, there's a really clear case of that. Um, it's the Shinko, it's the four builder. So yeah. the, this one was like, um, mm -hmm. this one was um, was a, an idea cooked up by Schinkel and Booth, the trade minister, um, mm -hmm. because they felt that like Prussian craftsmen were getting too crazy and were going off doing their own thing. And actually um, they were having too much power in the design process. Mm -hmm. So they decided they're going to um, basically... Uh, uh, published this installments of this book, which is this one. And they would um, have like craftsmen or Schinkel himself or certain craftsmen they selected would provide the models for um, this would be a pattern book that then craftsmen would be given and then they would copy it exactly and faithfully so that they would be able to control um, the decorative production of mm -hmm. um, Prussian products. And that was like the, the serious aim, clear stated aim. And in a way it's like a desperate act at the point in which you know that your time is done. So the architect at this point, like almost not quite yet in Prussia, but certainly in England, like, you know, your time is done, like you're not in charge. And so this is a kind of like, it was, it's like a last ditch attempt to kind of salvage uh -huh. the, the kind of architects um, control over design um, or the master craftsman's control over design in a, in a market which is just not going to accept it anymore. Yeah.